Elton John, your new album is called Reg Strikes Back, which suggests to me two things. One, you don't mind being called Reg anymore. Mm. And two, you're in a rather feisty or self-confident mood. Um, yes, I think the latter probably more than the first one. But no, I, I don't mind being called Reg so much. And also, it was a very tongue-in-cheek uh, album title after last year, with all that happened to me in the press over here. And that's made me, yeah, it's made me very feisty. And I feel probably more... Um, enthusiastic about things that I've done for about five or six years and uh, as a result of whatever, whatever happened last year in the press um, uh, made me more determined in the end uh, to just end an era of things like I'm selling all my possessions selling all my clothes at least stage clothes um, it's kind of like an end of an era or end of two eras or whatever it is and I just really I don't I just will have to start again and calling the album Red Strikes Back um, is sort of like coincides with the fact that I'm getting rid of a bit of Elton or a lot of Elton. You know. Well, we should explain the setting in which yeah, the, we are in. <clears throat> We're surrounded by all these sort of bits of memorabilia from stage wear that I've worn throughout my career. And my, I mean, the, if you lived in my house, which you probably there's no room to live in my house, but there wasn't. Um, it's just full of clothes and, and and stuff. And I just wanted. I got to a point where I thought, well, on the last tour, which was the Australian tour, um, I, got, I felt a bit uncomfortable in some of the outfits. I felt a bit. Um, especially during the rock and roll set. I didn't mind the Mozart bit because it got you into uh, the, the actual feeling of the, uh, the second half of the show. Uh, but, I mean, I knew it was going to be the last time that I was going to do wear the costumes. So I decided um, to go full steam ahead, and, and some of them I felt slightly ridiculous in, to say the least. But I thought, well, this is now the time to stop it, and it's got to stop now. Otherwise, you do end up... Someone asked me before... To this, um, about being an institution, and then it's very dangerous to become an institution. Um, ugh, I mean, that frightened me when he said that. But it's that—that's what you don't. I mean, it's, you can't stop being uh, who you are and what what you become. But you can certainly try and uh, make an effort to become something else as well. And otherwise, you just get trapped by everything. Well, there maybe are... I should have done it ten years before. I don't know. But uh, I mean, I. It's just goodbye. I have no regrets. I, I went to America for six weeks and um, they emptied my house out and I, I have nothing left in the house at all. Just one piano and two paintings. And so it's kind of, it's gone. And I don't feel sad about it. I just, you know, it's, it's, it makes you think, right, I've got, this, there's another era starting and uh, I enjoyed that so much and collecting things and, and all the costumes. I mean, but it's time to start something again. It gives you that impetus to, to try and start. Uh, so on stage I should be not as flamboyant as I was. My personality will always be flamboyant, but it will be hopefully more of a mixture of the Ray Cooper tour that I did in 79, where it was a mixture of theatre and flamboyancy. Do you think turning 40 had anything to do with it? Um, yeah, it's something to do with, I mean, this, uh, getting rid of everything, something I thought of over two or three years. It's not suddenly just sent me there, I must get rid of everything. Um, and I've always been very close to possessions and things like that. They meant a lot. Um, and it's something, it was kind of like when I first fired Nigel, and D, uh, Nigel Olsen and Dee Murray in my first band. It took me a long time to think about that. I knew how to do it, but um, it took me a long time to do it, to do it, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big decision. It's, but you have to be ruthless. If you, um, I, I think it has something to do with feeling uncomfortable in that stuff and being 40, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all right. I, I'm, it's been, I've been very lucky. I've been able to hide behind my piano a lot of the time, but there's no hiding place for this sort of stuff anymore. After all, it is the stuff of youth and good times and all. Yeah, it is, yeah. And, I, I mean, I just want to consider... I think if I want to become considered a more serious musician and singer, then I've really got... I don't think I can, uh, during my 40s, be con taken seriously if I'm still wearing that. I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining about the treatment I've had from anybody, but, I mean, there, I'm really th looking forward to singing uh, in my 40s. I, used to, I think I've always judged myself as a piano player who sung and I like to become a singer who plays the piano. So I don't think you can get away with that and be judged seriously anymore. I mean, I think a lot of detractors uh, uh, used to say, that, well, he doesn't need to dress like that. But I had a good time doing it at the time. But I think I know inside myself that it's time to stop. Well, you realise this is uh, an almost unprecedented step to take for a rock star, judging uh, in history from the who, saying, hope I die before I get old. Right. Of course, uh, Pete it Townsend is, yeah, It's like watching your own funeral, in a way. It's, it's kind of interesting. But I, I say I have no regrets. Uh, about it whatsoever, and uh, they just sit. It all sits in my house, and someone else can get the benefit of it. And um, I really have no need to be surrounded by this stuff anymore. Well, uh, although I never generally ask questions about money, I, I have to just ask one at this point. Obviously, the tremendous fire sale you're about to have oh. will raise a considerable amount of cash. Mm. Uh, uh, a long holiday, or how are you going to spend it? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. No, I don't think I'll be taking any more long holidays for a while. Um, I'm. 
I don't know. Well, I know we need a new centre forward at Watford, so that will have to. No, no, I'm going to pledge to put some more money to the football club. I have to, and I want to. Um, and I really haven't thought about that. I've really thought about the sale. I mean, I've done the, the, the pictures for the cover it's, uh, of the four books. It's a four-day sale in September. And I won't be here now because I've decided to do a six-week easy tour of America to ease my way back into touring, see what it's going to be like again, um, and see how the throat stands up to it, which I'm sure it'll stand up pretty well. I've, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and I'd like to do a six-week... I'm doing a six-week tour and hopefully getting a, a different sort of band together um, and going out there and... And using different people staging wise, just you know, to, to try and see how I feel about that. So I won't be here for the sale. I wouldn't have minded being here for the sale in the little ante room. It's kind of quite fascinating. It's like it is like watching your own funeral, isn't it? Um, hopefully, I will be around at that time. I mean, I'm not counting my chickens, <laughs> but it's it's um, it's it's it is kind of it's interesting. I don't think anybody's ever ever done it before. It's uh, goodbye, goodbye, Elbert. Good, goodbye, El yeah, it's goodbye, Elton. In a way, I mean, it's, no, Elton's a part of me, but um, I think there's a little bit more. Uh, I mean, I was street clothes. I shall always, you know, probably be wearing that stuff out on the street. I think there's a little more sanity and um, not so much recklessness now involved. I mean, it's just getting older anyway. You don't feel so reckless, and you don't feel the need to be that reckless. So. <clears throat> and. It's being surrounded by this lot reminds you of his job. It's just, it was fun for, for a long time, and I, as I say, it's just got to go. Are you going to keep the specs? The what? The spectacles. Uh, and some of them, most of them, a lot of them are going. The, the, the ones that I just, you know, keep in big cases that nobody sees. They're huge things, you know, the old one with the, the big wire bumblebee ones. Um, no, they're going to. Yep. There it goes. I recall last year, 1987, when you uh, put Watford up for sale. Mm. And uh, you said that it was because you weren't going to have the cash flow of touring. Yeah. And now you've agreed to this tentative uh, yeah. tour of America, which you say is a short six-week tour, mm. although, of course, for many people, six weeks would, yeah. be, would be a full job. Uh, have you had your arm twisted, or have you come... No, up? not really. Well, a set, a set, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, um, but I didn't need much twisting. Uh, but I only wanted... I said, right, I'll do it if I can use a different... I'm not abandoning the band totally that was on the new album. Um, I'm keeping David Johnson, but I'm, I just want to try the experiment t touring with other musicians to see what it's like. So I, I, that excites me, and uh, it really isn't that much hard work for six weeks. I mean, it's like only three or four gigs top a week. Um, and I just, uh, I'm going to use it to experiment a little. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, don't, I know with selling all this, people think, oh, well, he needs the money and everything like that, but it's nothing to do with that. I mean, that's just, I mean, obviously people, some people are going to think like that, uh, but it's nothing to do with that. Okay, my arm, I think an artist's arm always has to be twisted to do something sometimes, but you always have to have a little push from somebody to, to help you out in some way. I didn't want to tour this year, but then I thought, well, if I'm, I'm not going to be doing anything for the rest of the year except doing maybe another video, or just, and, I, and I'm, going to, I'm already becoming fidgety. So it's, it's playing outside places in America, and, like, uh, and I think that would... Uh, I've always enjoyed that. As, as I say, six weeks is, is nothing for me to... Six weeks for George might be a bit strange at the moment, but for me it's all right. <laughs> Is this going to be one of those tours where you base yourself in yeah. a few cities? Yeah, right. ending up with, I think, five days at the garden it ends up in. And so it kind of gets me out of the country as well to just when all this is going on because of the Ballyhoo will be... And, but some, one of them is, one of the sales is being... Tram, it's going satellite to America anyway, the jewellery show. It's like the Duchess of Old Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have at your left shoulder the mm. uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road jacket, and of course, recently, to the astonishment of thousands, if not millions, mm. that double album came back into the American charts. MCI have done a great job. I mean, it was their whole campaign with the live album, putting the single out was their idea. I wasn't going to put a single out from the double live album, and they said they think they could make it a hit, the way they marketed it, where they did it, and they're just so enthusiastic about it. For example, being not selling so many albums in the States recently, although one has had hit singles, um, and you give a company a double live album, and you think, oh, well, they're going to say, thanks very much, but no thanks. And they, would, they said, oh, fabulous, we'll do, it, we'll do this, we'll do that. And in fact, it's worked well for me. It's kind of got me a lot of recognition back from the adult, uh, the, you know, the AOR stations. Um, and it worked, the, the, the way they planned it was great, and this enthusiasm involved is tremendous. I mean, I've been very lucky that Phonogram have done very well for my career, every, all else, all throughout the world for the last few years. Whereas in America, I've struggled. And that's, you know, when you have hit singles and you have two top 10 singles off an album or two top 20 singles and the album doesn't get any higher than 50, something's wrong. So 
Anyway, that's that's be, that's gone now. But I mean, I'm, but it's nice to have a record company on your side. Well, for, so for the layman, record companies can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, and just the enthusiasm. It's just like walking into it's like Christmas time for me. It's like mm. really. And then you must have been doubly astonished when Candle in the Wind bounced back to be a hit again in the in live English. version in England. Yeah, that, that, I found that quite astonishing. I mean, I could understand America to a certain extent because it was never a single. Um, but over here it had been a single, uh, and then a hit again. And I did no promotion for it, I didn't do anything for it, and it was number five. So here you go, you schlep around the world, you do all the interviews, and the record that, that you, you said, oh, well, I've got nothing to lose by it coming out, and it goes to number five, and I think one of the quickest rising singles I've ever had in this country. It was great. I mean, I was, I mean record company here did a great job. It was, it was an added bonus at a time when I really needed a bonus, and it just is all part and parcel of, the, of cheering, getting more cheery after last year, and being positive, going back to work, um, getting healthy in your mind and your body and just saying, right, now I've got another chance. I'm determined to, to, to fight back. Uh, and uh, and it, 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 I think if you're positive, it, I've, I've had periods of my life when I haven't been that positive. It shows in my work, shows in your attitude towards life. And you've known me long enough to know that uh, when I am at my fittest and at my um, healthiest and at my... Um, determined I'm usually pretty life go, that life goes well for me so that's that's what I've got to be and that's how I feel like that now I feel really really happy about everything and last year did me good in a way it made me more uh, it, sh it showed me who my friends were which I've got a lot of it, it gave me great um, sense of um, at one point it made me very bitter what happened last night and then I just stayed at home and then it gave me a great sense of resolve to make sure that I came out of this okay and to just get back to work. And it's, getting back to work is the best thing that could happen to me. Well, I think almost everyone uh, in the business and in the country rallied behind you, didn't they? They did. It was fantastic. And I'm still, that's still going on. I still have the court case to come up and everything like that. Um, but I, I don't think anything could... I think, I've, I, as far as conquering um, being miserable, I think I've done that. I, mean, you, I, I did feel exceedingly sorry for myself at one point. Also, you can always just go on a plane, mm. go to a country where it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but also, but I didn't want to. I did, that's why it was good that I made the album in Britain, in London. I hadn't met, recorded in London since Madman Across the Water. And I want, if I'd have gone away for a long period to make an album, I, the press at that time would have said that I was leaving the country. And I, didn't, I wanted to stay here. I mean, I just... Uh, and it was, you know, uh, making an album with Chris again after an absence of two out studio albums was great because he'd just come off the In Excess album. He was in great spirits. And it was a very happy album to make. It, you know, there's quite a few up tracks on it. More, more like a Rock of the Westies album than anything else. Where I was very... Uh, I was frightened that I'd go in the studio and write all this mournful sort of... I don't know if you ever heard the last Marion Faithful album. She did a Torch song album. And uh, I was just uh, terrified it would turn out like that. As tears go by. No, no. I ain't going down. Oh, God, I ain't got great reviews. So there you go. <laughs> it must also cheer you up to see people like Paul Simon and Steve Winwood mm. winning Grammy Awards. Yeah. As if to say, your generation, for some reason, is still in the driver's seat. I think if you write good songs and you, good, you, and you make good records, there aren't that many quality albums around anymore. The, the essence of pop music shifted to the single and you must have a single on the album. You used to make albums and they'd pick the singles. And I think when you do get a good album, it stands out. Uh, and these people are talented people who are always capable of writing good songs. And even though they may, you know, have a lull like I've had, you can go through lulls as far as selling records, you will always bounce back if you've got that ability to write good songs and be a good singer, which those two people especially have. The Bee Gees proved it last year. And Rob, uh, Barry is such a good songwriter. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll be missing for a couple of years and then they'll always come back. Uh, because they have the talent, um, and like they've they've lived through a time when they've played live, they've done it all. You know, um, it's a very for new acts these days. It's very hard, and they they tend to make the records first, and then um, they tend to make the records first, and then go on the road. So it's 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 a it's a whole different scene these days. You got Pete Townsend to play with you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm pretty mad. <laughs> this is an um, attempt to murder a fly. Right, no, a mosquito, actually. Mosquito. One of the buggers bit me last night. Well, mm. No, yeah, Pete Townsend plays on the album. On and, um, But you can't hear him. He, came, he plays acoustic guitar. He says, can't hear him at all. Sorry, Pete. Um, that's the producer, not me. And yet his old mate, Chris Thomas. <laughs> yeah, Chris is, yeah. And Chris produced the album. 
Uh, and the, we've got Freddie Hubbard on it, and a couple of the Beach Boys, and Nigel and Dee, that's a wonderful thing. Nigel and Dee doing backing vocals from, uh, with Davey. Um, or no, they weren't speaking to each other either. <laughs> they had fallen out with each other. So I, as Chris Thomas suggested, doing them for the, uh, getting them for the backing vocal, I said, fine, that's OK with Davey, because he wanted those... There's a special blender. They did all the backing vocals on the old album, and they sound great. I just said, you make the phone call, not me. I, I mean, I, I, great, I'd love to see them, but I know they weren't talking to each other. But they did talk to each other in the studio, and then when they'd finished, they didn't. <laughs> Very weird. But anyway, that was... Um, that was the mostly the extent of the guest artists on the album, uh, and uh, and then of course our old friend Ray Cooper. Oh, Ray, yes. Well, Ray actually had played the percussion. He had broken his hand, so he everything he did on them was played with a broken hand. He came to the studio. It was the same time as my personal assistant Bob had broken his ankle, and Ray came in with a, we appeared in the studio with a cast, and we thought, oh, Jesus! But he he played, and um, hopefully Ray will be part of the band uh, that I tour with for six weeks in America. Um, uh, he's, uh, James Newton Howard is another one I want to get, and then I want to get a hot rhythm set. I'd like to get Omar Hakim and Nathan East as a rhythm set, and three three screaming black girls, and just go out and play my play the material a little bit meatier. I mean, not uh, I can't. It's not Benny and the Jets time again. It's uh, never will. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's it's just I'm going to go around, go listen to all the albums, select some of the material, maybe like Amarina, and just go out and funk it up. I have to try and change. I think a lot of people might be surprised and might not like it so much as the Elton. It's very hard to get, once you're in that position that I'm in, for you, people come away, and if you don't play things in a certain way, it's like when I had the brass section, people said, no, no, it's too powerful for you and everything. Some people loved it, some people hated it, but unless you try it as a musician, you're going to go nuts. Well, you think it's the same old thing where some people say, oh, I want more of the slow ones. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, <clears throat> you're never going to get away from that. But, I mean... You realise that, so you put some slow ones in the show, where well, you always have to anyway. But you, you can't let people dictate what sort of band you're going to have. And, and I mean, but a lot of people, with the, when I did the Ice on Fire tour with the band, there was a great band with the brass section, a lot of people, some people loved the band and some people didn't like that the, they felt it was too much for the, for the song, which I don't agree with. But at least it, it sparked a little bit of controversy. Well, many people outside the United States may not appreciate the formatted structure of the radio stations there. Yeah. But now, as the music business has moved on, uh, do you feel that uh, you fit into any one of these categories specifically anymore, or, or do you sort of touch three or four of them? Um, I'm definitely middle of the road. I'll always be that. I'm, I mean, no, but then so is, uh, so is George Michael. They play George Michael. I mean, it's... Uh, the only radio section I've lost slightly is the um, a is the AOR, which is but they only seem to play heavy metal music anyway, and I think you'll find that radio formula in America is going to change so much in the next two years. I think people are so tired of it, and I think um, gone are the days when they used to play two or three records that sounded different to each other. I mean, you used to be able to get Aretha Franklin followed by The Who, followed by Simon and Garfunkel, and you just don't find that. But if you do, they're on middle of the road stations, and now. Middle of the road station, and now the pop, like the Radio 2s of this world. Um, and I've never had any trouble being middle of the road, thank you, because I write ballads. But they, you know, well, I, th I mean, it's just, I, I, I get very confused about radio over there. I don't listen to it very much. It's just, you either hear one style of music, it's no, there's no adventure in it particularly. The so-called progressive stations, mm. on which you were once uh, a yeah. hero, have yeah. almost become regressive. Yes. Uh, I think college radio is about the biggest uh, radio in America at the moment. It's like they're taking the most risks anyway and playing you know, by new, stuff by newer artists and still playing s some older stuff as well. I think college radio is the most interesting radio, too, isn't it? Do you still keep up with the charts like you used to? Yeah, of course you have to. I mean, I've always liked records. Um, I don't buy them anymore because I haven't got any room for them. But, I mean, I buy compact discs and now everything... I've got the DAT machine now, so... Whoa, and they are quite remarkable. Uh, uh, yeah, I still like my favourite album... At the moment, it's Midnight Oil, uh, uh, which I think is superb. Uh, in Excess album I love, not just because of Chris, but it's just that's the new Crowded House album's coming out. I'm looking forward to that. Um, there's a, don't say that there aren't that many quality albums around, but when you do find one, you tend to play it all the time. And that's... Uh, it's a night, I love the single that's number one in, in England, Fair, Fairground Attract, or was number one. Fairground Attract, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's just it sounds like an old Motown record. So much atmosphere in it. No, you know, somebody said it was recorded more or less in one take or two days. It sounds like it. And it just shows that you don't need to have all the bloody machines that you sit through. You do a mix or, you, you know, the digital machines. I think we've, it's gone incredibly too far. I mean, I was, 
you go to some studios and bands have got all got computers and they're all I don't know it's it's very confusing for an old person like me but I just uh, we use digital stuff on the on the album it sounds good but I mean I do think things have gone a little too far it's crazy and you can come up with a record that sounds so good like that and to what extent do you punch in nowadays on vocals I don't I just do three vocals and they choose the best one uh, I remember in the old days Gus used to make me do the vocal all the way through till I go right more or less right to drop in uh, but nowadays, the technique is you do three or four vocals and the producer chooses the best bits of each, um, which I prefer. Um, and in fact, I kept on, the new, on the album, I kept a lot of, of the rough vocals. We kept about six rough vocals, which I did sitting at the piano and just run, the song was running through. And it's got much more atmosphere, because once the red light on, when the red light comes, on, there is something that happens, you know, you go, <laughs> you're, singing it, you're singing it away where they're getting the headphone mixed together and you sound fabulous. And then the red light goes on, you go, and it doesn't sound anywhere as near as good. So we kept the rough vocals in, and I think we kept about six of them. You're the one who's brought Dad into the conversation. It's mm. a big uh, music business controversy point. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, it is uh, the form of the, the near future? Um, well, having listened to it, yeah, it's, the quality of it is absolutely stunning. Um, I've got one upstairs which I'm pl playing, keep playing the album on. It's just, it, it makes compact this sound, obviously. Quite astounding. The Japanese are cunning, aren't they? Just when you bought all the equipment, they come up with another thing. I'm sure it's, it, it's got to be a plan, hasn't it? I mean, just when you bought the ladies Walkman out, they come with one that's ten times smaller. And ten, it's, um, it is a stunning sound, yeah. And, it's, and for the studio, you, I mean, you, you don't, it, 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 it eliminates so many other machines. So people are probably just... Uh, pooping their pants about it, I can imagine. But it does sound great. I've got to ask you uh, how you got Bernie Taupin's lyrics this mm. time. Mm. Uh, was it by fax or post? Um, some of them were by post, um, and some of them he gave me to, gave him, sent, sent them over by courier, and some of them he gave me himself. Um, and there was been, there's been no changes in the way we write. I, I spent six weeks with him in America recently, um, and seeing him every day, and it was delightful. It was like... Because one lives, I live here and he lives there, sometimes we get very stubborn about our own countries and he hates coming over here because of the press. And I sometimes don't like going to Los Angeles because you either like or love L.A. I, I really enjoyed myself there last time. But that's because I saw a lot of him and uh, it was just... Um, it was really, really nice to be, you know, to be with each other all the time. It, was, it was just felt very natural. And after 21 years together, it, it's, we were closer than I think we've been for the last 10, at least, just by seeing each other all the time. Because, you know, I... He, he he doesn't like coming over here that much. Although he is coming here in September when I'm on tour in America <laughs> to, to promote. He's got a book coming out, um, a, a first part of his autobiography, and so uh, we get on tremendously well. We've written a song for Olivia, which I co-produced before I came back with James Newton Howard. How about this one, for instance? Olivia Newton John produced by uh, James Newton Howard and Elton John. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's a brilliant one, I think. And that's uh, going to be the title of our new album, The Rumor. Uh, and then we've written, Bernie and I have written a song for AIDS, uh, to raise money for AIDS in America, or everywhere, when it's recorded, called um, Love is Worth Waiting For, which Peter Ash is putting together. So, project-wise, I've been quite busy. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm in the mood to be busy, real busy, keep, keep writing odd different things for people. Uh, and I find it easy to do at the moment. It's just the Olivia thing took a day to write and uh, two or three days to record. And it was it was nice, and I don't think productions for me. I mean, I, I enjoyed working with her on that one track, but um, who'd be a producer? It's a nightmare. Isn't it? Well, you've uh, had goes at it. In I've the had, past. No, I've done my own records. I did Kiki's record. And I did Blue, but um, I find with the equipment these days, I just got. I'm a, it's like starting with a computer. You know, if you, I, I don't even know where to, I wouldn't know where to start on a computer. I don't know what they're all about. And, Going back in the studio, it's, it's, it's all changed. It's computerised and it's all... You can take sample this and sample that. And it, it, I think eventually it takes all the, the feeling out of records. But anyone can get the same bass drum sound now. Anyone can get the same... It, it's like everyone takes something from the sound of everybody else's records, so they all sound the same and it takes the character out, I think, on a lot of records. Unless the song shines, shines through. And most of the records, the songs, are, the songs writing, I think in the charts isn't as good as it used to be. I, don't, I mean, that's a, just a general observation. And there's more accent on sound and, uh, and, and, and beat. Uh, Indeed. Uh, the singles have become records rather than performances of songs. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, when you do get a, a really brilliant record, it stands out more. Did you overwrite with Bernie this time? More songs than uh, Yes, we, well, 
We we had two or three other songs that aren't on the album, which we didn't. I didn't want to record 16 tracks because then by the time you've done overdubs, and then people that listen to 16 tracks and they disagree with what should be on the album. So we did 13. We had 11, and then Chris asked me to do two. Um, we recorded from 11 o'clock in the morning to late at night, and I used to go in at 10. For the two songs I wrote were Man the and Mad Hatters and Town of Plenty, and I went in at 10 o'clock and did the demo, and wrote, wrote the song, did the demo, so at 11 when he came in, they were done. It was kind of like... He was sort of whipping me a bit by saying, come on, I want you another couple of songs. Go on, you can do it, go and do it. And I was saying, no, I've already got 11 songs. Um, and he said, no, just do another two. And so I did. And uh, he was absolutely right. That's the whole point of having a producer. For the first single, you have uh, broken your own personal record for longest unbracketed title. Yes, I said, <laughs> it's a nightmare, isn't it? Um, and that was, again, was the record company's decision in America to release that. Um, I went with their reaction straight away. They played in the tape and they just went, that, that one. And whereas Phonogram, want, they, they weren't undecided between two or three. So I went with the, uh, the American company. Uh, it's always good to have first... Uh, I always go on first instincts and that, I, 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 that was one of my possibilities as well. Like, it may not be the strongest one in the rest of the world. I think everyone else wanted Town of Plenty in Europe. But you can't, I have to, with, with the old record company that I used to record for in America, I used to have to do two videos because they used to put out different singles first. And, one, and that's just a horrible situation. You don't know whether you're com coming or going. So it's, um, we shall see what we shall see. Oh. Well, you've returned to your old friend and video director, Russell Mackay, for yeah. I Don't Want to Go On With You Like That. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how that experience was. Um, God, I've never worked so hard. I was on a set when I, when I did my, you know, you sing it all the way through. I did that eight times, and then I, I was on a set for about seven hours doing the, the whole thing, uh, just on my own. And plus there's other bits. There's a girl in there who's going to be the new Anya from Nikita. There's the most gorgeous girl called Angie. Uh, something about girls with five, uh, with, uh, with A's in their names. And she looks stunning. And we did her bit first because she had to fly to Japan. And then we did my bit last. And I'd never been, I was, and I was standing up and playing the piano. Another thing that I've changed as well is I'm, I'll be playing an electric piano on stage. I won't be sitting behind a nine-foot grand piano, which gives me far much more, more mobility. I won't have to be stuck on one side of the stage. I can sit in the centre. I can, And so that is another thing that's going to change as well. So every, in, in a way, there's a lots of changes which weren't particularly planned, but, you know, when your positive things fall into place for you. And so I was standing up singing it, play, miming and playing this piano for seven hours, my feet were killing me. And I was, I, I nearly murdered Russell, actually, quite honestly. And it was like, he would do one line, and then he was on a, the, he was on a, a dolly. Uh, and then he'd do one line, and then come back for the next line. And I think we did that about seven times throughout the whole song. So, I mean, it was... I said, you better, this better be for a reason, because uh, I'm, I'm seeing it later, so he's probably praying that we're going to... I'm sure it'll be, it's interesting. It, it always is working with Russell. So... Bon voyage to some of the costumes. Yep. Bon voyage to a lot of things. Right. And, you know, thanks very much. And On to the next, next phase. Yeah. We have an American tour in September. Mm hmm and, and beyond that? Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I enjoy the American tour, I, I mean, uh, I might decide to tour to, to Europe. Um, it all depends on, as I say, how much I enjoy it and how the voice stands up to it. I, 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 there's no reason why the voice shouldn't. But I'm just no good saying I'm going to do a ten-week tour. Uh, when you can just a six-week tour and all my favourite type places, that would be all right. That's, I think it would be. And I, I can't really see me not enjoying it because I, every day I'm getting more enthusiastic about things. So life's pretty good. In the past, the uh, course of your success in European countries has been different from mm. that in America and Britain. How do you think you stand on the continent now? Well, since the last five or six years... Um, Photogram done such a good job. My career in Europe so far more records than I've ever... I mean, Ice on Fire is one of my biggest selling albums of all time. They've done a tremendous job throughout the rest of the world. I mean, Nikita was number one in Portugal for 13 weeks. Poor souls. God, dear. I dread going back to... I dread going to Portugal. Somebody would probably kill me. Um, and in Brazil, I sell 100,000, 200,000 albums now, and where I never did. So the record company for the rest of the world has really done a superb job. And, it, you know, you sell a hell of a lot of records in Europe. Thank God, because, I mean, I've had such disappointing sales in America. I think maybe I'd have thrown myself off a mini car or something. So, no, they really worked hard in Europe, and you tour there. You have to go to Europe. You have to do the television shows, and you have... They're, you know, and they're very loyal, much loyaler than, you know, a lot of people. Um, well, in Germany, of course, you've had great success in the 80s. Uh, well, it helps to be married to a German, doesn't it, really? I mean, like, the old record sales went up superbly. I mean, that's like... <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not lying. That, that did it. The record sales went up about 100% when that happened. And they've gone up everywhere in Europe. I know my used to, ne used to never give me away in France until Blue Moves of all albums. So, yeah, but you have to keep going there and, and not ignore them because 
one tends to think, especially Americans tend to think that America is the only record market in the world. Um, and it isn't. And by the time you can sell a lot of records. Japan, I mean absolutely nothing in Japan, I must admit. I mean, I do TV for them, I do a couple of TV shows, and I, I always send the odd message over there. And, you know, I must sell about 2,000 albums. But they try. It's just that, you know, Japanese people don't like, you know. So that's unfortunately that, that, that you can only try your best, and uh, the record company over there do. But I don't think it's been a, a woeful sales figures in Japan. Sorry, Japan. <laughs> I can't help but notice uh, Renata is not uh, on the credits now, though yeah. Chris Thomas is reunited yeah. with you. Well, um, it, Renata is engineering, uh, um, and we've got a studio at home, and she's been engineering um, some things for a couple of people. Uh, it's just, I think it would be dangerous to her. I mean, it's just a nice... I think if you got into that with a husband and wife relationship, I, I, it would be Jackie Trent and Tony Hatch time. So, no, I, she's quite happy not just to, to, to stay out of it, and I'm quite happy to, happy to keep her out of it because I, you know I think it's a dangerous precedent to keep. It's not. I, th I, th I wouldn't like. To, I mean, I, she's a great engineer. She's one of the best engineers. But I just think you just keep that part away from it. Yeah? Do you intend to make any more foreign language recordings in the way that you did a couple in France? Well, after Gloria Estefan, I might, the whole next album might be in Mexican or Spanish or whatever. Um, in fact, there is a, there's a track on the album called A Word in Spanish, and already the American company are trying to get me to do a Linda Ronstadt. So, um, you never know. It's, it's, it, it's, I don't mind. Um, who knows? I don't see why not. Uh, and Japanese is out of the question. <laughs> Well, you will have some time to pop over to Europe if you would like to for this album. I've already popped. And, yeah, I'll be popping quite a bit. Um, and it's great. I just don't take a day. I, can, I, I get to the stage where you, 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 you could, they let you go there and not rehearse or just like, go there and, and rehearse, do the thing, come straight back. You don't have to go there the day before. So it's called cool getting it slightly older and it's like top of the pops. I don't have to go down till four where everyone else has to go down at 12. It's fabulous. I mean, you sit down at the BBC all day, you go nuts. It's nice, isn't it? It's nice, yes. That's one of the rewards for being able to stay the course. Stay the course and you can turn up to the pops at four. <laughs> Happy trails to you.